everybody, my name is uh, Karthik Valuri. I'm a critical care doctor in Houston, Texas, also known as IATRO. It's my channel. For the last four months, I have been making videos about coronavirus, COVID-19. My purpose was to educate and bring awareness to what we all are facing. This will most likely be my last video for a while because things have gotten um, extreme in my hospital. I want to thank everyone for the last uh, four months who's been following me and supporting me on uh, social media. It's been amazing and I hope I could uh, give back as much as I could. That doesn't mean I'm going to stop. I'm going to try to find another medium in which I can continue to show the public what we face as doctors and healthcare workers. So let's get started. What happens if you get COVID-19? So if you get COVID-19, the general incubation period is around two to five days before you start feeling any symptoms. It could be as long as two to seven days, two to 10 days, or even 14 days. Anything after 14 days, it's usually rare. We have to categorize the people with COVID into groups. So group number one are the asymptomatic carriers. These asymptomatic carriers have no symptoms, so they don't get tested, because why would you, right? You don't feel anything. You, you, you try to practice everything you can, social distancing, wearing a mask and all this stuff or whatnot. They can spread the virus to people who are susceptible. So if they spread it, they won't know they're spreading it. They won't know they have it. And it can continue on and affect the people that can succumb to this disease. Do we assume the person that's walking down the street is an asymptomatic carrier? No, that's gonna cause a lot of panic. But just know that they are out there and you could be one of them. Group number two, we'll call them mild to moderate. This compromises 80% of our total population that has COVID-19. These are the patients that develop symptoms. These symptoms are fever, persistent, you can't break them, not feeling well, something's off. It's like a really bad cold. We've all had colds before, but some unique things about this group, they develop something called anosmia. They go into the shower, they can't smell their soap, and something called dysgeusia, where they try to eat their food and they can't taste it anymore. But the thing is, they're still functional. They probably feel terrible. They probably have symptoms of a very bad cold, but they can still exist calmly at home and try to recover. Now, during this time is where we can try all the remedies out there, mom's remedies, our ancient remedies, or whatever it is, supplements, sure. As long as it doesn't harm your liver, your kidneys, and you're taking it within the recommended dosing. If it works for you, try it. Try it, if you know, and you get better, good. I'm glad. You've toughed it out, you're staying at home, you're taking your zinc supplements, vitamin C supplements, you're trying to stay isolated because you don't want to infect other people. But now you start developing something called shortness of breath. And you're concerned because this is something new. And given all that we know about COVID, the next major step here is that a pneumonia might be starting. What I would recommend during this period of time is definitely getting a pulse oximeter and checking your oxygen saturation. Let's say you put your pulse oximeter on and you're walking around your house, you know, daily activities, and the more exertion you have, the lower and lower your oxygen goes. This is when we know that your lungs are being severely affected. The sustainable oxygen saturation is above 92%. Anywhere between 88 and 92%, you're in a danger zone. What you should do at this time is call your primary care provider if you have one, or call your urgent care center or your local ER and tell them your symptoms. If you have already been tested by this point and you know you're COVID positive, definitely, definitely seek medical help. You may be eligible to receive something called dexamethasone, which is a steroid, but it's not really been tested in an outpatient population, but you could receive it and it could help you. So let's say you go to the ER, the ER's job now is to determine, can I send this patient home? Does this patient need to be in the hospital? Or are you at such a stage where you need ICU level care? If you're group number three, you're moderately severe ill with symptoms which have now progressed to shortness of breath, and you end up in the ER because you can't breathe well. They'll run the basic labs. They'll know what your white count is, C-reactive protein, procalcitonin. There's different markers we look for, lactic acid, your ABG, your blood gases that tells me how much oxygen is actually in your blood, how much carbon dioxide is in your blood. There's a lot of things that we make a decision about. Once this decision is made and you are hospitalized, that's when we start getting into a little bit more aggressive care of COVID-19. The mainstay of treatment for COVID-19 is determined by three things. Number one, oxygen. 
How do I get you more oxygen? Number two is determining if you qualify for antiviral treatments or something to reduce the viral load or fight the virus. The next thing that we look for is how to reduce the inflammation in your body so it doesn't cause collateral damage and further destroy your lungs. So now you're in the hospital, group number four, severe symptoms, we start with oxygen supplementation. The normal oxygen in the air we breathe in room air is 21%. Oxygen supplementation is delivered by various devices. So a nasal cannula will probably be the first thing that you'd be placed on if you were hospitalized with COVID-19 requiring oxygen. A nasal cannula can give you anywhere between two to six liters per minute of oxygen. And the percentage of oxygen is around 24, you can probably go all the way up to 44%, depends on how many liters. If the nasal cannula can't provide enough oxygen, the next step would probably be to escalate you to something called a Venturi mask, which can deliver more liters per oxygen, more percentage of oxygen, non-rebreather mask, generally recommended against, because if you have these on, there's a high chance of aerosols going out into the atmosphere where it can potentially expose healthcare workers. So we sort of skip over that. The next major step is something called a high flow nasal cannula. It provides approximately 40 liters per minute to 60 liters per minute, depends on which company you use. And we can crank up the percentage of oxygen to 100%. Simultaneously, we'll be starting medical therapeutics on you. The one thing that's been shown to help is something called dexamethasone based on the recovery trial from the UK recently. What the theory here is that it's gonna reduce the inflammation in your lungs caused by the virus in our own body and help you to breathe better. Remdesivir, it's also possibly being implemented during this period of time because it could help mitigate the effects of the virus. If you have kidney failure by this time or any liver dysfunction, you would not qualify to get this drug. Other medications that are still in the trial phase, that means you'd have to sign up for it or you have to give consent for us to use, is tocilizumab. Condolescent plasma is basically blood taken from recovering patients, filtered, extract their plasma which has antibodies. Our hopes are these antibodies will help you recover because they will attack the virus. There are a lot of experimental drugs out there, including high doses of vitamin C, thiamine, melatonin, famotidine. I'd have to make another video to just go through them all. So if we see that you're requiring more and more oxygen on the general medical floors, you will also be doing something called proning. That means you'll be laying on your belly to improve oxygenation. Why this happens is that certain parts of your lungs are affected. Now, if they are affected, the blood flow through them can't receive the oxygen. So if we turn you around and position you in a way so the blood by gravity goes to a certain area of the lungs that are still open, potentially we can increase your oxygen. So we have maximized our high flow nasal cannula and you're still not saturating above 92%. We put you to bed, put a tube down your throat and attach it to a machine that mimics your lungs. This machine I can calibrate and adjust to deliver a certain amount of pressure, a certain amount of volume of oxygen, and the percentage of oxygen. And this is what I will be playing with in the ICU. At this point, you get into the critical group, group five. Other major complications most likely can and will occur. We've seen a lot of patients that are placed immediately on CRRT, which is continuous renal replacement therapy. Basically a machine that filters your blood and puts it back into you and acts like your kidney. Your heart's stressed out during this period of time. Your right ventricle fails, your heart fails, and now I'm having a horrible time maintaining your blood pressure. What we do during that time is maintain the blood pressure, maybe give you medications to make your heart pump harder. The other unique thing about this virus is its propensity to cause clots. Now these are blockages in your blood vessels. So let's say I am giving you the oxygen. The oxygen is going through your lungs somehow and getting into your bloodstream. But if there's a clot there, it is not getting transferred into your bloodstream. In order to get rid of these clots, we put you on blood thinners. Now these blood thinners potentially clear away these clots to allow easy flow of blood and the oxygen that we deliver can go to the rest of your body. So even during this time, we continue to prone you, flip you on your belly. Even though you're attached to a breathing machine, a kidney machine, and all these medications that are going in you. And it requires a lot of personnel. We have to be in that room, manually, physically moving your body around, but you're still not getting better. I'm watching your lungs, step by step, day by day, getting worse. I have nothing but to turn to something called ECMO. It might be 2% of the population that are at this stage. I take the blood out of your body, 
bypass your lungs, put it into a machine, the machine then puts oxygen into your blood and that oxygenated blood returns back to your body. We have to follow very strict criteria for you to be eligible to even be on ECMO because once you're on ECMO, it's a 50-50 shot if you're gonna survive. And after all of these treatments, the scientific research into new drugs and all these things, the treatment ultimately is so simple. It's out there. Wear a mask, social distance, wash your hands. Thank you for subscribing, watching, and following me these last four months. Be happy, be healthy, and thank you all.